with the development of new technologies, cutting edge engineering, and finally fabrication, putting it all together. Let's take a brief look back at the visionary journey to how we all got here today. So today was the final closeout of the purge. Okay guys, I can hear Rupa, uh, but- but a pretty emotional moment to be in there and actually you know, closing it up for the very last time, right? You know you're the last one to touch this. And so that was the final operation. And once that fitting is closed out, um, there's no more touching of the vehicle. We're ready for launch. The James Webb Space Telescope born from the desires of astronomers, achieved with newly invented technology, is the culmination of 20 years of work. Humanity has unlimited questions about our universe. Engineering a way to investigate them requires enormous creativity. Webb has been a trade-off between engineering performance, the, what the astronomers want, risk. In fact, when we started 20 years ago, we were actually looking at an 8-meter telescope. Developing the most sensitive instruments, and testing, and more testing. And so you don't want to build one that's just incrementally better than what you've got. Because if that's the case, you would just observe longer on the telescope that you already got. And so every time NASA builds a new astrophysics mission, a new telescope, it needs to be way more sensitive, you know, way more capable than anything we've ever built before. We all got together in that conference room and we played real time as the images came down uh, from the spacecraft, uh, the very first diffraction limited images ever obtained with Webb. And what we collectively saw as a group was the highest resolution infrared image taken from space ever. If you're just joining us, I'm Michelle Fowler at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and you are watching live coverage of the release of the first science images from the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's appropriate now that I send the broadcast to our colleagues and friends at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. That's the scientific nerd center of the entire web mission. So hello, good morning, Alex. The show is yours. Hey, Michelle. Welcome to the Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm Alex Lockwood, and I'm here with Carl Gordon, who is an astronomer and one of the key people in delivering the images that you're going to see here today. But actually, before we get into the amazing images, we're going to talk a little bit about where we are. We're standing here outside of the Mission Operations Center, which is the key central hub for Webb. For the past six months, scientists and engineers have been working 24-7 since they took control of the telescope 30 minutes after launch to prepare for today and for the amazing science to come through all of the major deployments, focusing, aligning the telescope, and calibrating those four amazing science instruments, it was all done in this building. And from here on out, we'll have daily communications with the telescope, including sending commands and downloading data with the help of the Deep Space Network. In addition to mission operations, we are also the home of science operations. Well, what does that mean? Every year, we solicit proposals from astronomers across the country for, and the world, for what they would like to look at with Webb. Then we hold a rigorous selection process to select the ideas that will best utilize Webb to study and understand our universe. When the data come down and astronomers analyze their results, we are the lucky ones who get to share that data and those amazing science results with you. And we knew that today was gonna to be so exciting with the first images, so we've actually been preparing for years here is Klaus Pentapodin, project scientist for Webb and the technical lead for the first images. Yeah, it's been a year to tell you process. about the process of the past I look few back years and of selecting the first the email targets. related to the uh, the first images was back from 2016. Uh, so back then, uh, a committee was created, and this committee was charged with coming up with a long list of targets for the first images. 
And the reason for that is that the observatory can't see the entire sky at any given time. And this is because you want to avoid the mirror seeing direct sunlight to keep it cold. And it actually had to be quite a long list. We ended up with about 70 targets from which we had to select only a handful. You know, what would create the most beautiful images, what would highlight the instruments, the four different four science instruments for Webb, and what would highlight the four uh, major science themes for Webb. And it's a celebration as well of the beginning of science observations. And we knew that selecting the images was just the beginning, that we would need a trained eye to take these exquisite data and pull out the beauty and the science potential. So here's Jody Pasquale and Elisa Pagan to tell you about how they processed these beautiful images. We're basically translating light that we can't see into light that we can see by applying uh, color like red, green, and blue to the different filters that we have from web. And the reason we want to color the images is because there's actually more that you can get, more information that you can get from the image if you see it in color. So it's a matter of picking and choosing filters and colors that enhance the details and the structure in the image itself. The shortest wavelengths of infrared light and assign those blue colors and then move our way down to green and red as we go to longer and longer wavelengths. And then we additively combine those together to get our full color image. But there is a lot of aesthetics that are involved in this. And painstakingly going through and cleaning these images up uh, with a, an attention to detail, a level of detail like at the pixel level in every image. So when I'm working on the astronomical data, it is this sort of marriage between art and science. When you're choosing colors for the filters, you really are trying to show the different details and the processes that are happening in astronomical images. But at the end of the day, you want it to be very compelling. You want it to be very beautiful because space is beautiful. And after those images were processed, there was a select few of us, very lucky few of us, who got to see the first images. So this is downscaled by a factor of four, exactly. So it's just to make it a little more and more handy, so it's actually higher resolution. So we have a team of about 30 people who are producing these images, and we feel incredibly privileged to be the ones were the first to see these science-like images. When, when we saw the first data come down of real targets, people were speechless and there were emotions because we immediately we could see how amazing this observatory will be. The detail, the sharpness, the depth. And when we saw the first color images, we knew that we had a winner. And now, we are ready to see Webb's first image of a star dying, a planetary nebula called the Southern Ring. Let's do it. Oof. Wow. wow, wow. This, this near-infrared image is, wow, the detail. Oh. <laughs> Wow, okay, well, here we are. We have a near-infrared image on our left, or on maybe your right, <laughs> and here on the right we have a near-infrared image. Um, and so I'm here with Carl, our, our astronomer uh, specialist. Can you tell us what we're looking at in these images? So this is a planetary nebula. It's caused by a dying star that has expelled a large fraction of its mass over in successive waves. Okay, so we actually see those waves in these images. Yes. Um, Wow, wow. And so there's a lot of structure. Can you tell us a little more detail about what we're looking, maybe start with this one on the left? Yeah, so in the, in the near-cam image, you see this kind of bubbly, uh, you know, almost foamy appearance throughout the whole nebula with some very structured uh, shells. But the, and this foaminess is showing up in orange mainly. And this is, this is due to the molecular hydrogen that's newly formed in the expansion, uh, just lighting up the gas and dust of this nebula. 
And then as we move inward, you see this kind of very uh, blue haze in the inner region. And this is actually due to very hot ionized gas that emits well in the blue um, that's heated by the core, the leftover very hot core of this star. And what about these like rays that I'm seeing in this image? Right, there. so there's also rays in the outer regions that you can kind of see, and these are holes in the inner nebula that are actually allowing the, the central star's lights to come out and kind of light it up like, uh, you know, patchy clouds with the sun shining through. Wow, oh yeah, that's what it looks like. That's so cool. Um, so you're actually a mid-infrared astronomer, which is different than near-infrared. And so what can you tell us about the details in this mid-infrared image? So this is, it looks quite different in color, um, partly because we're, we're seeing different kinds of physics going on here. So we're actually seeing in the blue, you see a lot of blue. The blue is actually due to hydrocarbon grains that are emitting very strongly in the blue for Miri. And they show the very similar structures to what we see in orange and near cam because the, the hydrocarbon, the molecular hydrocarbon actually forms on the surface of dust grains. And so again, as we move inward, we, we see that, that the inner region is again hot ionized gas, but now it glows red because that's where it emits longest for, uh, strongest for Miri wavelengths. Okay. And then as we go into the center, we see kind of the surprise for us, which is we knew this was a binary star, but we, ba we effectively didn't really see much of, the, of the, the actual star that produced the nebula. But now in Miri, this star glows red because it has dust around it. So in Miri, we got to see both stars very clearly. Yeah, yeah, you can't see it in first image, really, but there's two stars there. So that's a fun surprise. Um, and I think that there's another little Easter egg you want to tell us about? Yeah, so this was, uh, the Easter egg is this kind of uh, narrow filament up in, the, up in the top that's radially aligned. You can kind of see it very clearly in the mirror image. It shows up as this blue, blue structure, and it points very much to the central sources. So I thought, oh, this must just be a density enhancement in the outer nebula. I thought that very, very strongly, but other people on the team were like, no, it's a background edge on galaxy. Well, I made a bet that said, no, it's part of the nebula. By the way, I lost the bet because then we looked more carefully at both the near cam and mirror images, and it's very clearly an edge on galaxy with a dust lane and a bulge. So I lost the bet. Well, you lost the bet, but you got these gorgeous images. Oh. So I think it's a win for everybody. Win. Anything else you'd like to say today? I can't wait to see where we go from here. Oh, neither can I. All right. Thanks so much. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Alex and Carl. And I have to say that image is absolutely spectacular. So as you know, people from all over the world are watching us today and joining in our, in our excitement as we release for Webb's first science images. We've been checking in with our colleagues in Europe and Canada throughout the program, but we also want to take a moment to include the people at the oh-so-many viewing parties scattered around the world like stars in the night sky. So let's check in with some of them now. First, we go all the way to Perth, Australia. Do we have a signal from Perth? I guess nothing from Perth right now. Uh, maybe we have some of our other feeds. We're going to check in with them right now. Do we have Winnipeg, Canada? Oh, there it is. There's Australia. There's Perth. Hey, waving to Perth, Australia. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, next we're going to Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Canada. Hello, Winnipeg. At a planetarium. Everybody's enjoying the show, I hope. Okay, Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> Everybody's watching on the... Uh, there we go, Dayton, Ohio. Hello, everybody, Dayton. Nice to have you here with us. There we go, yes. Hey, hey, Dayton. Hey, <laughs> they're jumping up and down. <laughs> Hi. Okay, all the way, Bangalore, India. India, Bangalore. Hello, hello, hello to Bangalore, India. Hey. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. Hey. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the images we're releasing. Okay, of course, NASA's family extends all over the country. The team at JPL in Pasadena, California, they're on site to celebrate with us. So hello, JPL. Some of my favorite people in the world. Hey, hello. And I think the last place we're going to right now is North of Grumman, one of our major contractors. Hello, North of Grumman. Oh, hey, all right. <laughs> Yay. Nice to see you, North of Grumman. 
All right, now there's also a big watch party right here on the NASA Goddard campus. Many of these people have worked on the mission itself, and we also have top NASA leadership and representatives from our government. So hello, <laughs> hello watch party at Goddard, yay. Okay, wonderful. So, I mean, at NASA, we are so fortunate to have all of these friends and colleagues around the globe. A major partner in the Webb mission is the European Space Agency. ESA contributions have been essential to so many aspects of this project, including Webb's spectacular launch on the Ariane 5 rocket last December. I'm very pleased to turn over the show for a few minutes to Katie Haswell. She's joining me from the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany. Hello, Katie, good afternoon. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome to Germany. We're at the European it's Space Agency. It's a I'm still getting all kinds of IFB from lots of center. people. And it's where the teams effectively fly the satellites. They're a little bit uh, of a cross between air traffic controllers and uh, pilots. We have lots of different control rooms here. This is the main control room and as you can see today it's not in use so we've been lucky enough to uh, move in here for today. I have two very special um, experts with me, both scientists from the European Space Agency. Uh, uh, Giovanna Giardino is a uh, NIRSPEC scientist. Giovanna okay. is, uh, has been working on that for, for many years and lots to tell us about that. And Mark McCorcoran is a special advisor for space, for science and exploration. These two guys have been working on the Webb Space Telescope for a long time. So we're very grateful to have you with us. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Um, Pleasure. We, we are excited to reveal our image with you. But before we do that, we thought we'd give you a little bit of background um, because we've come here today uh, because these guys were the first ones uh, to pick up the signal uh, during the uh, web launch, when web first launched. They run a system called S-Track, which is NASA's deep space uh, tracking system, and they were listening out when Webb called home. And uh, the controllers here have been looking after a whole very, very impressive list of missions since uh, 1968. ESA has played a very, very important role during the Webb, uh, for the Webb Space Telescope. They provided the launch on board the awesome Ariane 5 launch vehicle from the Guiana Space Center. The atmosphere in the Mission Control Center was uh, electric, I can tell you I was there. Um, they've also provided people. We have 15 ESA scientists working at uh, Space Telescope in Baltimore, and also they have provided the um, uh, infrared uh, spectrograph, the near-infrared spectrograph, and also half of the MIRI instrument, which is the mid-infrared instrument. Let's take a look at those now. Webb's four scientific instruments include NIRSPEC, the Near Infrared Spectrograph, led by ESA. NIRSPEC splits near infrared light from astronomical objects into its components. Like a barcode, this will help scientists understand the physics of the objects they're observing, from their temperature to atomic makeup. NIRSPEC can observe parts of an object or the sky using an image slicer and an array of microscopic shutters. Webb's integrated science instrument module, located behind the main mirror, also contains MIRI, a mid-infrared camera and spectrograph. Seen here during testing, MIRI has been developed by a partnership between Europe and the US. MIRI detects mid-infrared light from planets, stars and galaxies. It can analyse molecules to help us deduce what astronomical objects are made of and peer into clouds of gas and dust where stars and planets are born. Together, these instruments will help Webb detect and analyse light from the very dawn of time, revealing the universe as never before. So... So let's get ready to reveal our image. And remember that one of Webb's jobs is to find out about galaxies, more about the galaxies, but also to help us to understand how they change. And this image is going to be very, very useful for that. Let's reveal it now. There it is. It's called Stefan's Quintet, and it's wondrous. 
Giovanna, what are we looking at? Yes, like you say, a quintet. So we are looking at five galaxies. Galaxies are uh, this giant structure that, as we've seen, we see everywhere around us in the universe. They contain from million to hundred billions of stars. And in fact, we live in one of them, the Milky Way. And here we see uh, five of them. This is a, a closer um, a galaxy uh, in the foreground. And these four are uh, at a distance of about uh, uh, 300 uh, uh, million light years from us. And they're locked uh, in a close interaction, a sort of cosmic dance driven by the uh, gravitational force. Um, you can see here yeah, these two uh, in a process of merging uh, 